let, let me recap briefly, and I know that many of you um, have been on a webinar before. Wheel and Anchor is about bringing traffic travelers together. So we are a growing community of people from across Canada um, who are, have a passion for travel and not just the ordinary kind of travel, but doing things a little bit uh, out of the out, nor, uh, out of the ordinary. And that's what um, makes us all sort of of the same ilk and why we're, um, why we're part of this community and we have as I say, more and more people joining all the time. Um, and so our goal is to bring you all together so we can have some great fun and, and some great trips. Um, my personal goal for each of you um, is to be well-traveled and well-connected. And just briefly what that means for me, when you're well-traveled, you just simply have a greater understanding about other societies, cultures, people, um, food from around the world. And let's face it, if we had a greater understanding of one another as human beings on the planet, I think that um, we would we would be a better place to live. So, um, And travel is a big part of that. That's how we learn about um, uh, about our fellow um, citizens of the world. And being well connected simply means you are connected to other people who have that same passion and drive for travel. Um, and also being connected to people that you might meet along the way as we travel through these different um, interesting countries. And I've heard so many stories and I have so many of my own about meeting, you know, that stranger talking to somebody at, a, at the dinner table in a bistro in France or something like that. And, and you've struck up a conversation created a bond with somebody and this is what we're about as well um, and I really emphasize that because we're more than just a tour company that says oh on the left is this and on the right is that we are really about delving into um, um, into these places that we're visiting. The team with me today, um, as usual, so my name is Gordon Dreger. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder of Wheel & Anchor. I'm here with Joel Curry, who is uh, silently in the background providing our uh, technical support. Um, and of course, Cassandra, um, who's also here on the background listening in. She is our senior member services specialist. Many of you will have spoken with her on the phone if you have booked a tour. Our plan for this morning, um, it's really, again, about you. You're here because you're curious about some of these places we're talking about organizing trips to and about exploring the world. Um, I'm here to facilitate this discussion, this journey that we're going to take, and to explore with you. I mean, I've been to so many places before, and yet my passion is to go back again and again and to bring people with me and to show you the amazing places around the world. So that's my job in here. And, of course, the world, which is your oyster. And it's the subject of what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to briefly uh, recap um, what we uh, uh, did in part one. Um, and uh, we don't have a slide for this, I'm sorry. But so wh what we talked about in the webinar a couple of weeks ago, we talked about South America. Uh, we talked about Argentina and Chile, Peru and Ecuador, as well as Colombia. Uh, and we, we spoke a little bit about the British Isles, some tours we're thinking about in English, England and Wales. Um, some people mentioned they were really interested in, in visiting South England, um, about Scotland and as well as Ireland. And we talked a little bit about Africa. We touched on South Africa, a program that we're just designing now um, that we're hoping to release by the end, uh, by the middle of September, um, as well as East Africa uh, and West Africa. So if you want to find out more about those, what we talked about, there is a copy of that, a recording of that um, webinar available to you. <clears throat> and um, we'll, we'll put it um, it's on our website under webinars. So if you go to community and then click on webinars, you will see um, a recording of all of the webinars that we do. So you never have to miss out on anything. So let's jump right in to our topic this morning. Um, we're going to be covering, covering a couple parts of the world, starting with Southeast Asia. We're going to then move on to Europe, then talk about Antarctica, and we're going to talk about Canada. Um, so let's start with Southeast Asia. So there's a couple of different programs that we're contemplating here. Um, and, you know, we can look at, and Southeast Asia covers a vast, vast geography. So where do we start? Because um, if I look at all the questionnaires, so many people have written down Southeast Asia as a place they'd like to visit. We're going to start with the Mekong River. And the Mekong River is, uh, as you know, is one of the longest in, in Asia. It's the 12th long longest river in the world, in fact. Um, and it, it it flows all the way out of the Himalayas and, and down through China, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, before it ends up um, dumping out into the, um, uh, into the South China Sea. 
And the Mekong River is really a fascinating um, journey that you take. The, the best way to do it, obviously, is by ship because that's why we get to see all these towns and villages along the way. It begins with Ho Chi Minh City, um, which is the, the um, city, the economic um, capital, not the political capital, economic capital of Vietnam. Um, and we make our way over the period of a week up the rivers. We're obviously going upstream um, towards uh, Ton Le Sap in Sim Reap. Uh, and the Mekong River is, uh, there's, there are so many um, amazing how shall I say, not just the cities that we see, and we'll talk about Ho Chi Minh in a second, but it's really about these small villages. And our ship will pull up to a riverbank and dock on the side, and you'll get off via um, a gangplank, and you'll, you'll, it's like stepping back in time. And I'm probably going to say that a hundred times today. But this is the way to explore this part of um, Vietnam and Cambodia, which if we think about it, 25 years ago, um, they were virtually off limits um, because of the, the political conflicts that were going on there. Ho Chi Minh City, also known as Saigon, as I mentioned, it's a very, very dynamic city. I first went there in 1994, so 25 years ago, and the whole city was all bicycles. Today it's changed quite a bit. You can see the skyscrapers, the modern towers, but it still retains that charm of the tri trading port that Saigon once was, except that everybody's riding around now on motorcycles instead. Um, Ho Chi Minh is a great spot. One of the highlights for me is visiting the Coochie Tunnels, which are um, a series of tunnels that were built during the, the uh, Vietnam War um, as a way for the, um, the Vietnamese to, to uh, escape and hide away from and elude um, the American um, invaders. A fascinating, fascinating um, place to visit. Um, continuing up the river, and again, we're all, I'm going to just talk about the highlights. I could go on for literally hours just talking about the Mekong River. Um, Phnom Penh, which is the capital of Cambodia, uh, and uh, it's a very sobering city to visit. I mean, Cambodia as a country um, is still um, relatively poor. It's economically still behind its neighbors, um, like even Vietnam. Um, but it, it has, they call it the city of four faces. And, and that's partly as a result of the various influences that have come into Cambodia over the years, whether it was the French um, um, influence, just as in, in Vietnam, um, but, you know, even the, during the dark period of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll visit here, among other places, the uh, genet genocide center. Um, where the victims from the so-called um, killing fields, um, which is known as Chung Ek, um, um, were kept. It's, it's, it's not as modern a city as some of the other ones. It's just coming up. Um, but that, I think, gives it a, a certain... We get to look a little bit at what life was like in um, Southeast Asia, in this country, in, the, in this part of the world, sort of 25, 30 years ago, if you compare it to... Um, say Ho Chi Minh or Hanoi or something like that, who have developed far more. We continue up the Mekong River uh, and come into Ton Le Sap. And Ton Le Sap is the largest freshwater lake uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and the whole lake level is really governed by uh, the monsoon season. So it is uh, at its smallest during the height of the dry season, around 2,500 square kilometers, but it explodes to over 16,000 square kilometers. So it, it becomes five times, almost six times the size um, um, at the height of the, 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 um, the wet season. And you see all these villages up on stilts. I can tell you it is amazing amazing scenery the tonle sap is the discharge of the tonle river they meet um uh, it meets the mekong so it's a tributary of the mekong at um, Phnom Penh um, and depending on the time of the year and depending on again those water levels determines how far up we can navigate on our boat um, because our destination is Siem Reap uh, and the the temples of Angkor Wat and so on uh, and so depending on where we go on the river we will disembark uh, and continue the last bit of the journey up to Sim Reap by ship and Sim Reap is really all about Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat um, I'm sure you've heard of it before. Um, it is uh, the largest religious monument of the world. It is absolutely gigantic. It, 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 it covers some 170 or 270 hectares uh, of land. It is 
Um, it was originally built as a, as a Hindu temple, but it was converted along the way, centuries and centuries ago, into a Buddhist temple. It is amazing. But there's not just Angkor Wat. So Angkor Wat, everybody flocks to. The tourists go there by the thousands. It's a very busy place. But in the area of Sim Reap, and I'll talk about it again in a minute, there's literally another 50 other temples. And I'll come back to some of those in a minute. So we end the cruise part. So we're going to do this by cruise we spent a week out of Ho Chi Minh City and up to Ton Le Sa and, uh, and then ending up in Sim Reap. Um, and then from there, then we would continue on our journey flying out to one of the other stops. So I want you to ponder that a little bit, what you think about uh, about the Mekong and, uh, um, you know, that, that whole experience. And um, let me know then if you have any questions about it. Um, but it's definitely something that we're going to offer um, in the next year and a half or so. Um, then we had a lot of people ask generally about Southeast Asia. And so that's why I'm in the midst of conjuring up this great program that's going to cover a wider area of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. Um, and so, you know, it's a massive geography and it's really difficult to see anything unless you're, you know, one of those backpackers in their twenties, um, that has, takes months on end, um, to, to literally trek from little town and village to, 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 to the, to, to another little town and village. So, what I've done is, uh, or what I'm in the process of doing is looking at what are the key stops that we could make. And I want to create a tour as if you were a backpacker, but of course, you know, we're, most of us are past that ilk where we want to throw a, a, a rucksack on our back and, and go and stay in hostels. So we, but we want to create that experience of visiting some of these places. And so I'm going to take you through a few of them now on what would potentially be an itinerary that would cover a good chunk of Southeast Asia. Um, and we're going to start here in Hanoi. So we talked before about Ho Chi Minh City. Um, Hanoi is the political capital of Vietnam. And it's very interesting the, 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 how different these two cities are because Hanoi is a government city. And you, you see that in you know, the Communist Party buildings and so on, very stark um, um, stark uh, buildings. It doesn't have the, the dynamism, right? Uh, and so you know, I, want to, I don't want to... I want to be careful not to make too many analogies about what government cities are all about, but it's, there's just a, a laid backness to it um, in, in Hanoi. It has a beautiful old quarter and this part of uh, Vietnam in particular is known for their whole water puppet theater. They have this great culture of water puppets. So to go and see one of these shows, we'll probably see more than one when we, when we visit Hanoi. From Hanoi, you can't go to Northern Vietnam without going to Ha Long Bay. Uh, I'm sorry, this is for me one of the most spectacular um, um, scenic sites anywhere. Um, I've only been there once, it was a long time ago, um, but it is truly amazing. These mountains of limestone stick out of the sea uh, and uh, amongst this turquoise blue waters, you get a sense of it here um, from the picture and you um, sail around either for the day or possibly we would go on an overnight um, and uh, go amongst all of these incredible, incredible mountains. As I say, I was there a long time ago. It has gotten very, very busy in Halong Bay, but that does not detract from the scenic beauty that that it is. It's this is one of these must see type places when you go to this part of um, this part of Asia. From here, from Hanoi or from Halong Bay, which is a couple of hours drive outside of Hanoi, we would fly then probably right down to Siem Reap. And again, I talked about it briefly again. Um, Siem Reap is, um, Phnom Penh is the capital, but everybody goes to Siem Reap, um, which is not to say that uh, Phnom Penh isn't worth visiting, but Siem Reap, you, you come because of all of these temples. And you need to spend at least three full days here um, in Siem Reap. I think anything less doesn't do it justice because a lone anchor Wat is probably a day and with all of the, 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 the crowds of people and so on, um, it's exhausting. But you want to go and see the other temples like Angkor Thom, which is much less known. It's not far away from Angkor Wat. It's again, they're all, you know, within a 20 minute, 30 minute drive at the most of um, Siem Reap. Um, but also Ta Prom um, is a, one of the most intricate temples I've ever seen. And, you know, I have seen a lot of temples, um, you know, and sometimes I know when we go on these trips, we, we see temple after temple and we get bored because they all look the same. It's not the case here in Simri. The, 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 the level of detail and the, the, the design that they've put into these um, 
statues and figurines is so different between the various watts. Um, it, it's hard to explain. And, you know, they weren't, they, they were all built in the same general time frame, but, but not forever apart. Anyway, I have to keep an eye on the time because we have a lot to cover. Siem Reap, a major, major place to, um, to, uh, to visit. I'm going to drop in the map again, just for one second here, just again, to show you where we've been. So we started up in Hanoi, um, which is up in the North part of the Vietnam. We jumped down to Siem Reap. Um, and now we're going to pop back up into Laos. And Laos is one of those countries that uh, it, it tends to fall off people's um, um, bucket lists, if you will, or it wasn't on there to begin with, um, because Laos is, is quite is, is quite a poor country. So it's, um, as far as um, GDP per capita, it's even less than Cambodia. Um, and yet it has some amazing sites in and of itself. Vientiane, the capital, um, I actually celebrated Christmas here one year, a number of years back. Um, and it's, it's a very quiet town, but it has some spectacular um, temples such as this one here. Um, and you really get a sense of this um, style of Buddhism that they practice here. Um, the, um, I, I recall walking around um, this temple three times. That's the ritual um, and, 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 and doing these prayers. And you feel an energy in the Ancien that I didn't really feel anywhere else, perhaps in Myanmar, but uh, the Ancien is a, as a capital. It doesn't need a lot of time, two full days in the Ancien, and you get a really good sense of this capital, Laos. Um, the other city um, in Laos, which is not in our presentation today, is Luang Prabang, um, and we'll probably um, I'm confusing Joel with the slides. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we'll probably make a, a trip up to, ah, there's Luang, Luang Prabang. It's just, it's just out of order. So Luang Prabang is a UNESCO World Heritage City on the banks of the Mekong River. Um, and you, you, you're here up in the mountains. So you're surrounded by, um, you know, um, not super high mountains, but um, jungled green um, mountains. This, this, uh, the Mekong River um, sort of spreads out almost into like a delta at this part. There's some beautiful trips up and down the river. Um, and the, the, the village of the, the village, it's a, it's, a, it's a budding city now. The old city of Luang Prabang is really um, an amazing site. It's one of my favorite um, cities to visit, visit in the whole area of, of Southeast Asia. So again, this would be another hop. We'd probably spend a couple of nights in Luang Prabang. We'd then head back to Bangkok. So I'm going to confuse Joel because he's going to have to jump around again. <laughs> there we go. Um, Bangkok needs no introduction. Most of us know Bangkok. I think probably we, you know, if we haven't, if you haven't been there, you'll have an association with it, perhaps from like one of the Hangover movies, as sort of a, a party city and sex tourism and all of the, the the griminess of it. But there's so much more to Bangkok than that. Sure, it's a big city. Um, it's one of the largest ones in the whole region. Um, with over 10 million people, um, and it sits very low in the water on the on the um, in 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 the delta of a, a couple of different rivers that flow into the Gulf of Thailand, um, and. In particular, you have to go and see the royal palace here. As you know, they have a new king since the last two years. The previous one was the, the longest reigning monarch passed away. Uh, and uh, the, the golden royal palace here is absolutely breathtaking. Uh, right across the river, there is another amazing stupa. Um, and the Chow Praia River, which winds through Bangkok, is also neat because while you have the most modern skyscrapers and shopping malls, I was just in one literally a few weeks ago, um, this shopping mall like I've never seen before. Um, and at the same time, you go to a floating market where you have um, predominantly women, but some men as well that are around in their canoes and they're selling flowers and they're selling, um, you know, some Thai food and it is stepping back in time. Again, I, sorry that I keep using that word, but it's, um, it's, you, you see it, you see two completely different sides of Thailand and Bangkok you know, within a short stretch of this river. An amazing, amazing place. So Bangkok is worth a stopover for, um, again, at least a few days. And then from there, we'd head up to Chiang Mai, which is in the northern part of Thailand. Um, Chiang Mai 
is most known for um, its temples. And it's, it, there's literally, the old town has a moat, a square moat that goes around it, and inside of which are some of the most diverse collection of temples that um, you'll ever find. So you can spend a day wandering around the inner parts of, of Chiang Mai, but Chiang Mai is also known for the, the again, the countryside around, the rolling hills. Um, here is where you'll also find um, the long neck um, um, tribe, the, you know, the women who have had these rings since they were uh, small girls put around their necks um, and it's ex extended their necks. And, you know, it's, it's quite a sight to see. And I think there's been some controversy about whether that is, you know, like uh, abuse or something like that. But in fact, you know, the, the women really cherish this tradition. Um, and, you know, as long as they keep the rings around their necks, apparently, you know, they're they're, they're fine, they're, they, they, they can live a, a normal existence. So it's one of the many things to see, uh, one of the many sides of Thailand. So we've sort of bounced around um, Southeast Asia now. We talked about, um, um, we talked about uh, th these various cities starting in Vietnam, then going on to Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. So I think that we could string together about five or six cities I would say an average of three days each, and we'd have a lovely 18 to 20 day program, which would give ample time to see these places on their own. They're all safe cities, uh, and they're worth um, spending time wandering, in addition to obviously the, the organized part of the tours um, that we would do. So let's jump then down a little bit to the south and head down to Indonesia. So Indonesia is something completely different. As you know, it's the largest, um, um, a Muslim populated country in the world with over 250 million people um, that are spread out amongst 17,000 islands. And God knows, you know, a lot of them are totally uninhabited um, and the vast majority are, are never seen by anybody from the outside. But we have a chance to get to see a bunch of them. Um, and so the, the focus of this trip that we're proposing to do, uh, that we will be doing in fact, is um, Bali and then going by a ship. Um, and so much like uh, the ship that we took uh, recently in uh, along the Adriatic coast, a small ship of around 40 guests. Um, so it's an intimate experience. And we're gonna sail out of Bali, out to the west towards the famous Komodo Islands. But let me talk about Bali for a second. Again, when you think about Bali, you'll all, maybe some of you have been to Bali before, but you'll have your own um, sort of um, um, visions, your own images of what Bali is all about. And for a lot of people, I hate to say, Bali is, um, is, is a place that's about beaches and parties where Australians come and hang out. And that's largely true. And a lot of people actually never make it away from the, the main tourist spots on the south of the island, like Kuta and Seminyak and so on. But Bali is a big island and there's so much to see there. We're going to stay in and around Ubud, which is the cultural capital of Bali. Um, and it is a absolutely charming city. I can remember walking down these streets um, and the architecture. And this is one thing that, that, that really differentiates Bali in particular and other places in Indonesia from, let's say, Thailand, because they have such an attention to design. Every single house has these beautiful gates on it um, and in behind um, incredibly designed um, sort of houses that all carry a similar sort of Balinese style to them, but at the same time, each one is is distinct. Bali is about rice paddies, like you see here. You drive around, um, you see incredible rice paddies. Anyway, Joel's pushing me on because we, <laughs> we, we have to watch the clock. I, say, I could go on forever about Bali. So the program that we're going to do is we're going to fly into Bali, we're going to get on a ship, and we're going to head right out um, and we're going to visit a couple other islands. Lombok is the island immediately adjacent to Bali. Um, it's known for um, some beautiful secluded beaches like you see here. It's a quieter version, although it's gotten busy in recent years. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's 
really takes a step into the nature. Um, Mount Rinjani is a volcano. I've always wanted to climb that one. Um, so it's a, it's a climbable mountain, but we'll just spend a day in Lombok to get a sense of what this island is all about. And then we're going to continue on. And again, the destination, we're going to stop at a number of different islands, but our, the highlight, what we're really after is Komodo Island. And this is in a very remote part of Indonesia. So really, unless you take a number of island hopper flights or you go on a, a small yacht like the one we're proposing is, is, is larger ships go here as well. Um, but because it's obviously a protected um, uh, environment because of the Komodo dragons, um, you know, the best way to go is on a smaller vessel. You could see a, a couple of them there. This is where the Komodo dragons hang out. And, you know, the Komodo dragons, I think, are right up there, you know, with tigers or lions or rhinoceros of, of animals that you just want to get a chance to see in the wild. You know, they're the largest species of lizard weighing upwards of 100 kilograms, um, the largest ones, because they don't have any um, natural predator, predators in their, in their territory. And you, you, you can see what the landscape is like here. Scenery is majestic. The Komodo dragons, an amazing thing to, um, to, to witness and check out in the wild. Um, so as I say, our trip would be roughly a, um, by cruise. Um, it takes a couple of days to get out to the Komodo Islands and come back. Um, and then we'd come back to Bali and we'd spend probably at least five or six nights. I think most people do Bali too short and they, they also stay in the wrong place. That's, that's my personal opinion about Bali. I think we would stay um, in and around the Ubud area. We also to have the volcano in Bali, which is um, for those, it has uh, settled down a bit. So um, I don't think you can climb it at the moment, but it shouldn't be going off anytime soon, um, as well as heading up to the north coast of, of Bali as well. So let's take a, a, a quick moment to um, ask, to, to sort of to address any questions that you might have um, about anything that we've talked about so far about Southeast Asia. I see a couple of questions have come in. Um, Jill asked, um, um, how is the security situation down there, particularly in Thailand and in e Indonesia? I've heard of some problems. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, th these countries, like a lot of different places, they, they, they definitely um, have from time to time um, some challenges. I mean, Thailand, uh, you know, went through a coup and military rule um, until about six months ago when it had free elections. But that being said, the reality is, is that day to day life there, if you look at Thailand, for example, as, as many of you know, I spend a lot of time in Thailand. It is absolutely calm and stable. And I think that the, the, the government situation there brought, brought stability to that country. So Thailand is about as safe as it gets. Um, they've had no incidents recently, but you know, you, you know, one needs to, 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 um, uh, to be on alert, so to speak. But I think from a, even from a petty crime standpoint, um, a place like Bangkok is, is about as safe as, as you can find anywhere. Indonesia similarly has had um, political troubles of late, um, but those are most mostly internal things um, as they sort of change from one government, uh, you know, from left leaning to more right leaning. Um, but that being said, um, the country is um, very stable, very visible, very safe. Um, Bali has not seen any incidents in a long time. Um, it's, it's relative calm there. So I think you can say that about just about anywhere in Southeast Asia at the moment. I mean, there's things going on in Hong Kong. And I could go on and on and on. But safety, you don't need to be concerned. We wouldn't go anywhere that I wouldn't consider safe, that I wouldn't travel myself. Helen asked about um, rough seas. How are the seas rough? Because I said that we were going by um, um, by ship. Um, so the seas, once you get amongst the islands, yeah, sure, you're going to get some motion from the seas. But because it's a whole archipelago of islands, you don't generally get like super rough conditions like you'd find if you went down, you know, the coast of the North Atlantic or even the coast of the, the Pacific. If you take a cruise, um, you know, to, to Alaska or to uh, down the... Um, California Panhandle, for example, those can be fairly rough waters. We generally don't, we generally have pretty calm waters. That being said, as I always say, I highly recommend getting some bracelets or some taking some, um, um, some of those patches that you can get for motion sickness. <clears throat> uh, then we have another question. What time of year is it best to visit Southeast Asia? 
Well, that's a good question um, because it's actually different um, if you're in uh, countries like uh, Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and so on and so forth. Their dry season is typically um, between sort of uh, late December through um, April, although April, May gets very, very hot. So we're probably looking at going there. I'm thinking about January or February. It's a nice time of the year. The weather is dry. Um, and uh, it's cooler as well. I mean, when I say cool, the temperature in, um, in, uh, the, in the northern parts of Vietnam can actually drop to the single digits in the wintertime. So it can be quite cool. So we're, but we're looking at our winter just for the stability of, of the weather. When you talk about Indonesia, all of a sudden you're on the, in the southern hemisphere, you're south of the equator. Um, the best time of the year there um, their dry season is is almost the opposite. It actually runs from May till September. Um, so we probably, I'm thinking about going at the tail end of the, of the so-called monsoon season um, in about April um, because the weather's still lousy here at home. So here, who wants to be here? Um, and yet it's a great time to go when you're in not quite um, when the high season starts there again. So so that's what we would do for, for um, Bali in Indonesia. All right, I think that's all for the questions so far. Let's move it right along since we're already ha uh, 30 minutes into the program. <laughs> I tend to talk too long. I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit, um, but of course, as I say, I'm, I'm happy to hear your questions as we go along. Let's talk about Europe. I'll touch briefly on Romania, then I'll talk about our Baltic program and then the Greek islands. Um, so I just want to mention Romania. A couple of people People had, had um, um, said in the, the questionnaires that we sent out that they were interested in visiting Romania. Romania for me is an un, is, a, is a best kept secret. It's a beautiful, beautiful country, uh, and it, with some amazing scenery and architecture. Um, we would um, start in the capital in Bucharest, um, and Bucharest is. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to jump forward a little bit here. Bucharest is a city that was. Um, an absolute gem architecturally um, all the way up until uh, the period around the first or the second world war. Then of course, you know, it reverted to Soviet rule and it really fell into decay. And I went to um, Bucharest the first time about ooh, 16 or 17 years ago. Um, and I was really struck by compared to other places like Prague um, or, or Poland uh, that had emerged from the cold war. Um, it was really in, in still in decay. Um, Bucharest has one amazing feature to it. It's got lots of things to see, but the People's Palace that you picture here is the second largest building in the world after the um, <clears throat> after the Pentagon. Um, and, and this was really an example of what dictators can do because Ceausescu took all the country's money into building this, this incredible, I mean, the ballroom alone can fit two 747s inside of it. It's, it's, it's like nothing you've ever seen. So Bucharest is a highlight. Bran, of course, um, home of the legendary Dracula's castle, this amazing castle perched up on a hilltop in the middle of the Carpathian Mountains. The countryside here is absolutely gorgeous. And talking about Transylvania, you know, there's lots of legends and myths about vampires and all the rest of this. It is, Transylvania is simply the central part of Romania, surrounded by the Carpathian Mountains. Um, and uh, you have uh, these, all these towns and villages um, all over the place um, that are, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's breathtaking countryside and people here are, a lot of them are still living like you, they lived sort of a hundred years ago in, in Western Europe. Um, they just have evolved more slowly over time, again, largely due to the suppression during communist rule. Brasov for me is one of my favorite towns because it's like a mini version of Prague. Everything, all of the buildings um, have these incredible, you know, Baroque and Ro uh, um, Romanesque architecture to them. The red roofs, the cobblestone streets, um, again, surrounded by these beautiful green mountains. It's absolutely spectacular. I'm thinking about a program here. I'm curious for, you know, feedback from our members. Yeah, is Romania a place that you thought about going? Would you consider going there? Um, so we'll jump forward now to uh, over to the Baltics. And again, I'm picking up the pace a little bit just in the interest of time. So the Baltics is probably one of the top five areas that our members have requested. The Baltic Sea, of course, um, is this you know, massive ocean that separates Scandinavia, Finland from the Baltic countries and of course, Russia. Um, most people do the Baltic Sea on a big cruise ship because they're, oh, I'll just knock off all these ports and in a week I can hit um, all the major capitals 
skills. And I think, you know, that's, that's fine. And, and, you know, if you want to get a taste of these places, but they are really deserved of more time um, than just, you know, from six in the morning until four in the afternoon kind of thing. I don't, I, I, I think, uh, and so therefore I'm going to do, we're just working on the program. Now we're going to do the, the Baltic program um, uh, with lengthier stops um, again, you know my philosophy. I like to do three nights or even four nights um, in each city that gives you a chance to absorb the local culture. So let's go through them now. Starting in Stockholm. Stockholm is my favorite city in Scandinavia, hands down. I just love Stockholm. Uh, I've been there in summer. I've been there in winter. It's colorful. Um, it's the home of the Nobel Peace Prize that's awarded in that. You see the... Um, um, the red spire building that's actually the city hall where every year the nobel prize is, is handed out um walking around gamla stan the old town which is a little island in the middle of the of the city um surrounded by all these beautiful waterways they have an amazing park called your garden which has got um various museums in it since i was last there they now built an abba museum so for abba fans um you can see that and of course the stockholm archipelago which when you go out there on a boat it is, and we'll do that because we're going to go between the cities by ferry. Um, then the Stockholm Archipelago is like being in Muskoka in southern Ontario, um, or in um, no, or in in Newfoundland. It's it's rocks, it's lakes, it's spectacular countryside. From Stockholm, again, if at least three nights there, we're going to head over by ferry. So we're going to do this using the local transportation. And the ferries there are fantastic. They're gigantic. They're as big as cruise ships. And on the way to Finland, we stop at the Oland Islands, which is this outcropping of rock. And again, you remember I was just saying, it kind of looks like um, the East Coast or Southern Ontario with all of the rock. And we'll stop in at Mar Mariaham. Um, a lot of pe people miss this. Um, cruise ships don't generally go here or very few of them do, but you get the, the islands are part of uh, Finland um, and you, you really get a flavor of what maritime like is life is like um, when you stop into the Oland Islands. From here, we continue again by ferry, heading straight into Helsinki, which is, of course, the capital of Finland. And Helsinki is the white city. And it's not because everybody is white and blonde. That's not true. <laughs> Although it is more so true than it is in Sweden. Um, but it's because of the granite building. So all, a lot of the buildings in the center part of the city, not the one that you see in the picture here, but the um, the main cathedral are done in this um, beautiful white granite. That's why it has this title of um, white city. For me, the, the they have this amazing fortress, the Suomenlina fortress, which is on a group of islands um, at the entrance to the city. And you can wander around that for hours, if not days, um, checking that out. Um, and my, my other favorite thing to do in Helsinki is the rock church, where they blasted a church um, right out of the rocks. Um, and you can go in there. And if, we, if, if we're lucky enough to catch a concert in there, it's amazingly um, acoustic. <clears throat> Sorry, the acoustic qualities are, are amazingly good. Finnish people are very withdrawn and the city has this whole flavor. Stockholm is very dynamic and the Swedish people are sort of very party happy and, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, very convivial people. And the, the Finnish people are very sort of very laid back, very quiet. I don't know if you've ever met um, Finnish people before they, you know, it takes them almost 10 minutes before they open their mouth to say anything. Um, and, and Helsinki as a city is, is very much like that. It's, it's hard to describe, um, but quite a contrast to Stockholm. From Helsinki, once again, we will go either by ferry or by train, um, because I think that the train ride as well is perhaps more scenic um, than the ferry. We're going to sort of work out logistics on that. It's longer to go by train, but you go through the beautiful South Finnish countryside and we come to St. Petersburg, which undoubtedly is the, probably the biggest reason why most people come to the Baltic region. St. Petersburg, formerly known as Leningrad, the second largest city in uh, Russia. <clears throat> And it's an amazing city. The, the highlight, of course, the Hermitage, which is the world's largest collection of art and antiques um, that you can find. It is an incredible, incredible museum. 
that alone you could spend days inside of. Um, and hence the reason why you need to spend at least three full days in St. Petersburg. I'm toying with three or four um, because there's just, there's so much to see here. It's a city of gold. The buildings are often adorned with, um, with gold. Um, they have, uh, you know, places like the Pushkin Palace, which is this massive um, blue hued palace uh, that sits just outside of the city. Um, so many things to see in St. Petersburg. It, it really doesn't require any, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of it or seen a documentary or something. Um, I like personally the drawbridges. They have these drawbridges throughout the city. And if you take a boat cruise at night, it's one of these sort of secret things, not secret, but best kept secrets, um, so to speak, is to go around and see all of the drawbridges, which mostly go up um, at night when there's less traffic. So very, very cool city where we'll spend several days. Um, and from here, we'll then head down the uh, east coast of the Baltics to Tallinn. And so the program that we're envisioning here is the main program is going to take in Stockholm, Oland, Helsinki, St. Petersburg, and Tallinn. Um, <clears throat> and so this will be our last stop for those who don't want to continue on to the other Baltic countries. Tallinn is is again another gem of a city that a lot of people don't discover. If you do a Baltic cruise, you invariably stop in here, but again, they don't spend enough time to, to do it justice. It's only 400,000 people, um, but it has, um, its old town is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, and so you get, again, this flavor of of Eastern Europe, these colorful buildings, um, and a city, Estonia as a country, has really advanced economically a lot um, since the fall of, uh, of the Iron Curtain. Um, and, and Tallinn is really um, the nicest city, I think the nicest city in in the Baltic region. So the main part of the Baltic program would end there. And then again, I've come, we, we found a lot of people interested in our phased approach to tours. So the second phase um, of this trip would be continuing on to Vilnius and to Riga. Vilnius is the capital of um, Lithuania and affectionately is referred to as um, the G-spot of Europe, which is their, their own um, sort of marketing around it. But, um, and again, I think that they've, um, traditionally not, uh, you know, it hasn't been a huge tourist mecca. There, I think, is a lot to see. They have, again, a, once again, an amazing old town. Floor. They have a, a rather remarkable Jewish quarter in the town. There. down overland um, by train to uh, or coach um, to Riga, uh, which is the capital of Latvia and actually the largest of the cities in uh, the Baltic region. Um, yeah, there we go. There's Riga. And Riga is... Uh, the thing that strikes me the most is it's an Art Nouveau city. And I personally am a big fan of Art Nouveau architecture. I think it's amazing to have over 800 buildings that look, that are in the style that you see in the picture here. Um, so you get a sense of it. So we would, um, again, do this program, the main Baltic tour with an extension onto um, to Vilnius and Riga that would make the whole thing probably around mm, three weeks in duration, which would give us ample time to actually um, enjoy and soak in some of these some of these amazing cities. So let's now take a jump down to the south part of Europe. Uh, and again, I'm mindful of the time because we're already 45 minutes in. Um, the Greek islands. Uh, and so once again, uh, I think it's on a lot of people's wish list is to head down to the Greek islands. Um, and there are so many of them that we can't see them all. <laughs> it's just not going to happen in this lifetime. You get a sense of it here from the map. Um, but the, for me, the, the ideal combination is to do the, the known Greek islands together with some of the lesser known Greek islands. And, you know, I've been to a bunch of these myself, um, but similarly, like, like many people, you know, buy a ship where you arrive in in the morning, you're out again in the afternoon, and you just when you've caught your breath, you, 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 you're kind of like, wow, that was magnificent, but I didn't get enough. I need more. So um, my Greek islands uh, that I'm contemplating, and again, I'm anxious for feedback from, from, the, from the members, is 
to visit um, a few of the key places like Santorini Mykonos. Those are names that will undoubtedly be familiar to you. Um, and then also take in a few of the quieter places, but to do it by ferry or local flight, um, depending on the distances that we're going to cover. So first of all, looking at Santorini, um, again, it needs no introduction. It is this classic um, Greek island with white buildings and blue roofs, um, the most, I think, the most photographed island in Greece. Um, and it's, it's also known as the wine island. And, you know, we don't drink a lot of Greek wine here, um, but I think we should because there's some really, really good ones. Um, <clears throat> Mykonos um, also needs no introduction. So these are two of the islands that are very well known. Mykonos, of course, for its um, jet set um, lifestyle and nightlife and the beaches and, and so on. But it has some beautiful seaside towns. And I remember being in Mykonos and really just walking around the main town because we didn't have the time to go and explore other parts of the island. And there are um, lots of other nooks and crannies that allow you to get away from the, the, um, the super busy touristy areas and see some of the real part of these islands and how the real people live. Um, <clears throat> that's, for example, what Paros is all about. So here's Paros as an island, and you can see here again that classic all the white buildings, um, and they call it the poor man's Mykonos because uh, it's not, it doesn't have the jet set reputation that Mykonos does, and that's where you get a chance to witness what life in the Greek islands is all about, is in a, in a place like Paros. So my, what I'm envisioning here is that we would go and spend two or three nights in each place. Um, in, in Santorini, you need to spend three nights. Mykonos, you can probably get away with two. Paros, because again, there's more to explore. I probably spend at least three nights in here um, to get, so you get a sense of, of the island and sort of the real Greek, um, the, the Greek experience. And then there's Crete. Crete, which is a huge island um, down in the southern part of the Cyclades. And the um, Crete, once again, most people say, oh, I've been to Crete because the ship docks in Heraklion and then they get out for the day. But, but Crete is a huge island. So you could spend literally two weeks just touring Crete and you wouldn't even cover the whole thing. So Crete is some place that we probably end our trip and then fly from Heraklion back to Athens uh, to then continue on or back to Canada. Um, and it's uh, it has a myriad of, of Greek sort of mythological sites um, and towns, um, an amazing, amazing island. But that's just a few of them. I'm, you know, sort of figuring out in my head what combination makes sense. Um, but I think looking at those islands, we have some known ones, some lesser known ones. Um, and, you know, to spend two weeks and visit, let's say, a four islands, maybe five is the way I would envision exploring the Greek islands. Um, so let's do a quick Q&A here before we get on to the last bits of our presentation. Um, and uh, let me just see a couple of questions have come in. Um, how long, uh, Helen, uh, has how long it takes to get in between the Greek islands? Um, it depends. We, as I say, would mostly go by ferry and most of the ferry rides are not that far. Um, if you're going between Santorini and Mykonos, you're talking about three or four hours. Um, if you're going all the way down from uh, Santorini to Greece, uh, then it's sorry to Crete, then um, that's going to be a longer journey. So I think the optimal time is, is about three or four hours to spend on a ferry. If it's going to be much longer than that, we'll look at using um, domestic flights because many of the islands are obviously connected by, by an island hopper type service. Um, then June asked about uh, the, the weather in Scandinavia. Well, <laughs> it's a good question. Scandinavia, northern climb will likely go in summer. I'm actually thinking about next June or July um, to go to, uh, to the Baltics um, because, uh, let's face it, we benefit from the longer days. Um, you know, up in Sweden, for example, it's sunlight till night, 11 o'clock at night um, in the end of June. Um, so it's a wonderful time to go. It's cool. Uh, I mean, you know, if they get temperatures in the mid 20s, that's a warm day for them. Um, although, you know, recently Europe has had a lot of heat waves and so on, but it doesn't ever get that warm. And in the, in the evening time, um, it's often cool, particularly because you get the breezes coming off the sea. So I would say highs in the low to mid 20s and um, you know your, your evening temperatures are in the high teens um, and then finally let's see one more question here is the Baltic region expensive yes 
Um, well, yes, um, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, those Scandinavian countries, because of their social structure, are quite expensive. Um, and so we're, you know, I'm looking to make this program as um, as value minded as possible. Um, but yeah, you can go out and, you know, using the, the Big Mac index, you know, if you go out and buy a Big Mac meal in, in, in Sweden, you're probably looking at $15. It's probably 50% more expensive than, or more than what you paid here. Um, and similarly, even alcohol, although our alcohol, uh, beer and wine has gotten expensive in Canada, it's even more expensive. Um, on the other hand, Estonia, um, is is more reasonably priced, um, so it's I would say a little bit less expensive than Canada. Similarly, Russia Russia is, it can be expensive. If you want to go nice um, for a nice meal out in in St. Petersburg, it's uh, it's going to be um, fairly pricey. But you know we have lots of ways to um, organize things to to make it um, you know to to get you good value for your money. So um, good, let's, let's jump forward again, looking at the time. Uh, I want to uh, keep things moving along. Let's talk briefly about Antarctica. Um, and we've had a number of people ask for Antarctica. I've been blessed to visit Antarctica twice. When we talk about Antarctica, we're really talking about the Antarctic Peninsula, which is that um, little tail of land that sticks out from Antarctica heading towards South America. That is where 90, 8% of all Antarctic tourism happens. Um, and we are looking at um, taking an allotment of space on a brand new hybrid ship, which is just being launched next year in 2020. Um, we are looking to go in January of 2021 um, from um, Albatross. This is a, a company I've worked with for many, many years. And um, Surin, the, the, the owner, um, is, a, is a good acquaintance of mine. Um, and he's, he's quite an ambitious and quite an interesting, and, and he loves Antarctica. And I love Antarctica. So just touching on it briefly, um, the biggest, I think, issue that people have with going to Antarctica is, is leaving out of Ushuaia, which is a beautiful little town. It's not very big in Tierra del Fuego, which is, you know, one of the, the southernmost city in the world. You can see the mountains and behind it's so picturesque. Um, you get on a ship and you cross the Drake Passage. Um, that's what worries most people because, of course, the Drake Passage where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet are, is the roughest water in the world. So, you know, anybody that tells you otherwise uh, or tells you that it's going to be smooth sailing is, is, is not totally telling the truth. Um, the ships that we typically go on, you know, like uh, the, the one that's being built by now by Albatross or any of the ones I've been on before, have pretty good stabilization systems that minimize this lateral roll, which is what really the cause of seasickness is. Um, but that being said, you know, it is, it is not for the, for the, for the faint of heart, which is not to say that, you know, the last voyage I did, it was a couple of years ago to Antarctica. Um, and we had quite a strong, we had a, a Beaufort six, seven crossing the passage. So we had good, I'd say 30, all of 30 foot seas, um, and yet most people were um, able to sort of enjoy the passage in, in relative comfort. So um, once you cross that, you know, one of the places that we could stop on a longer Antarctic journey is the South Shetland Islands, um, which is this archipelago just off of um, and teeming with wildlife and whales, particularly the whales that you see in and around the South Shetland Islands are quite amazing. Um, the peninsula itself, probably best known for its penguin colonies, um, you know, and, you know, it's always funny to see the first time people see penguins and everybody's so excited and by the time you get to the sixth or seventh day of the cruise you're just like oh it's like you can't look at any more penguins because they smell quite strong um, but it is an amazing sight to see a part of the world that is truly untouched um, and there aren't many that you can say it's 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 not obvious that, that people have been there other than a few of the research bases and so on that have been um, set up. So that's Antarctica. We're thinking about it for January of 2021. I realize it's not everybody's thing, but it is an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. So last but not least, let's come back home to Canada. Um, because uh, this was another learning for us as we evolved our um, list of destinations um, is how many people said, what about here at home? We want to see more of Canada. And so, um, you know, there is so much to see. And and yet, you know, I'm, I'm myself, I'm a, how should we say, um, I'm, I'm 
a bad person, not a bad person, but uh, I, I have seen um, less of my own country as I have of other parts of the world. Um, here are a few of the things that we're working on. Um, first of all, the Atlantic provinces, and as many of you will know, I just returned back from having a number of members events um, across um, the Maritimes and Newfoundland. Uh, and, you know, I really got to realize um, how much scenic beauty there is out in the East Coast that we forget about. So I'm looking now at about a tour around um, the um, uh, around the East Coast uh, of uh, Nova Scotia. So taking in the Bay of Fundy, so um, Digby, um, and going down to Yarmouth uh, and uh, continuing up to places like Lunenburg. It is so picturesque. Um, the countryside. People are so lovely and friendly. I mean, I can compare it to Toronto because um, that's where that's where I'm from, and obviously many of our members. Um, but but it's a totally different attitude. People are just way more laid back in Nova Scotia. The seafood is amazing. Um, I can't say enough about um, about Nova Scotia. I think that you know we could spend easily. Um, a week just touring around Nova Scotia. I didn't even talk about um, Cape Breton um, and that that whole part of the province. Um, then we'd probably um, go up then to do Prince Edward Island. Um, I was also fortunate to spend a couple of days here. I had never been in Prince Edward Island before. And yet it is, you know, it's sublime, the rolling countryside and the farms. Um, and it once again, you know, great um, food, particularly if you go in lobster season, which just um, began. And if you, if you like, um, if you like um, lobster, then there's no other place than Nova Scotia or, or Prince Edward Island. And what I also found in Prince Edward Island that people may not be aware of is there's some wonderful festivals. The Charlottetown Festival, it just ended about a week ago. Um, they have another festival up um, towards Summerside called the Indian River Festival. Amazing, amazing experiences um, and music and so on, artists that come from all over the place. So you know, the, the maritime province is uh, very, very interesting and worthy of, you know, even a 10 day program out there, I think would be quite, quite uh, well received. Newfoundland, well, Newfoundland, as you know, has exploded in popularity um, in the last few years, partly thanks to, um, you know, the musical Come From Away, which is playing in more and more cities across um, across North America and now you know, off into Europe as well. Uh, and I, I frankly have um, only ever visited the Avalon Peninsula, which is the area around St. John's and to the south. And that alone, um, so we're thinking about doing a wheel and anchor weekend there, possibly in the off season um, as, a, as, a, as a quick little um, sort of sampling of um, St. John's and the environs and all of these little um, fishing towns or former fishing towns um, that exist. Um, we get an, you can get an insight into this whole offshore oil industry, which is, you know, they say is there's as much potential in um, the Atlantic seabeds um, as there is in, in, in Alberta and the tar sands and what the future of all that means. And so there's so much to learn about Newfoundland. And of course, you know, they have their own accent. They have their own, you know, they, they talk talk a little bit differently. So if I'm, if anybody from Newfoundland is, but I mean, I think you'll know what I mean. I, and uh, you know, the Celtic, Celtic heritage and the influence there. So Newfoundland is, I think to do Newfoundland properly as a whole province um, and maybe even touch on Labrador, you need at least two weeks of time. It's a massive amount of area. Um, so this is something that we are um, seriously looking into putting together for um, probably 2021. Um, is when we'll realistically um, get something together for Newfoundland. Um, for our friends in uh, Manitoba, um, you know, you've probably already done the trek up to Churchill, but maybe you haven't. Um, but I think, first of all, that Winnipeg is a very underrated city in Canada. Um, it has an incredible cultural and art scene there with the whole, um, you know, uh, Winnipeg Opera and, and many other things. Um, having visited Winnipeg in spring and taken the, the Via Rail trip from, um, from Winnipeg down to Toronto, which I thought was amazing. So I'm, it's the type of program I'm thinking of doing where we perhaps actually travel by train um, if you're coming from southern Ontario or from the west coast to travel into Winnipeg and then do the trip up to Churchill of course um, sorry there's the shot of, um, uh, of uh, Winnipeg um, and the, the the bridge in in downtown which I remember walking across on the way to our event um, but um, uh, Churchill, which is, of course, the polar bear capital of the world, uh, and people come from all over the world to see the polar bears. Um, the train ride up is supposed to be absolutely 
um, amazing. They've now restored the link um, between um, Winnipeg and Churchill so we can go up and see these amazing creatures. So, so this is something as well that uh, people have sort of alluded to that they would like to do. It doesn't have to be a super long program. We could probably make a nice week out of it and visit a little bit of Manitoba, um, again, taking into um, both Winnipeg um, and Churchill. So, uh, talking briefly about the West Coast now, um, Explore BC, and this is a, a program that I actually put together for, for another group um, that they went earlier this year, and they did a whole tour all the way around British Columbia, which for those of you that are from out there, you're probably like, okay, you can, you can tune out this part of the presentation. But I know for people in Ontario, they, you know, everybody's, or I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people have visited Vancouver and maybe they've been to Victoria on the island. But what about all the rest of this, you know, supernatural British Columbia, as the tagline once went um, for, the, for the province? So much to see. I think that, you know, we would undoubtedly start um, in, uh, on Vancouver Island, um, which in and of itself, um, you know, Victoria is, has so much British influence and charm and, you know, high tea at the Empress Hotel um, and Butcher Gardens and all the rest of it. But then there's Tofino and the whole West Coast, which is amazing, amazing, uh, you know, temperate rainforest. Um, and so in the program that I um, designed before, we actually um, went overland um, from, uh, from Victoria up to Tofino. And then we flew um, in a chartered aircraft from Tofino up to Haida Gwaii. And Haida Gwaii, which uh, some of you will, will know as the Queen Charlotte Islands, um, is, is really a magical place in Canada. And of course, you know, it was the home of the Haida peoples who unfortunately met um, a, a sad demise through disease and so on. Um, but they left behind uh, this incredible culture. They're most known for their, for their totem poles. But of course, the wildlife up here in, uh, in Haida Gwaii is, is like no other place. It is truly um, an amazing abundance of sea life and birds. Um, and uh, and bears, of course, and, and and all the rest of it. So Hawaii, Haida Gwaii, you know, we could go in for a few nights. It's worthy of more time up there. Um, I wish there were more options available for for touring around in in a boat. But there's just there's actually a surprisingly few ways to sort of visit the whole set of islands. So I'm on the lookout for stuff there, um, and then crossing back over. Um, um, the, the, the sea again and the inland passage, um, we hit Prince Rupert, um, which, you know, here all you can see is forests. And let's face it, I mean, Prince Rupert is a, mostly a, um, a lumber town, um, but it's also known for its um, prevalence of, of brown and grizzly bears. And, and I think that that's, um, I know for the group that, was, that I sent out there in, in June, um, they had an incredible time seeing these, um, seeing all of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the the bears in their natural environment. Um, and finally, the Okanagan Valley, um, which again will be familiar to many people. I know we have quite a number of members who are based um, in Kelowna or in the area. Um, and it is an incredible wine region um, with now some really now, a, you know, globally recognized wines um, and, and that, I mean, there's the countryside as well. And they have a, also an indigenous heritage, um, some very interesting sites um, to visit in uh, Osoyoos and some of the parts, um, you know, on the south part of Lake Okanagan. So I think that we could spend literally two weeks um, doing a tour of, um, uh, of Western Canada and, and really sort of get a, a great flavor of what, um, what the province of British Columbia is all about. So, I note that we're already just over an hour, um, and so we're going to slowly move towards the end um, in case anybody has any other questions about um, the last two programs we talked about, so um, Antarctica and Canada, and I do see that Jill again has asked about the weather in Antarctica in the wintertime. Well, their winter, it's, so it's our winter, which is their summer. So Antarctica is typically, um, you get daytime temperatures well up to 10 degrees. When the sun is shining, it can be quite warm in Antarctica, talking about sort of January, February, which is the prime season to go. It cools down quite a bit at night, but as we always joke, or as I've joked when I've been in Antarctica before, is just that it's warmer in Antarctica in January by, by a lot than it is in most places in Canada. Um, so really, it's, uh, it's quite a great experience. <clears throat> um, 
And then John asked about when we will be offering the tours to the East Coast. Yeah, I don't have a specific date in mind, John. I'm, I'm thinking already potentially for as early as next summer um, to do some programs in uh, the Maritimes in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island um, because uh, I think that it's something that we could book on somewhat short notice. Although, you know, to go in the prime time, which is really when you want to go, um, sometime between mid-July and mid-August, um, the hotels and the accommodations do get booked up quite a bit. So uh, it's, it's, um, if we're going to do that program next year, uh, we'll, we'll launch it in the next um, couple of months. Um, good. Um, well, that pretty much wraps up our uh, part two. I appreciate your indulgence. We went a little bit over, uh, over an hour on this, but we covered a lot of territory. And again, the point of this is really for um, us to hear from you. What do you think? I got some great feedback after our first Outlook webinar. Please keep the comments coming in. What do you like? What don't you like? Where do you want to go? Um, this is what we want to hear from you. The more feedback we get, the better we are able to create programs for our members. This is what we're all about. Um, it's like I have lots of great ideas, but my ideas don't mean anything <laughs> unless people decide to join us and come along on, on some of these trips. So thank you again. Um, and yeah, I don't see any other questions, so we'll wrap it up there. Um, I appreciate your time. Look forward to your feedback um, and uh, let us know as well if you received your latest print newsletter um, with the topic of France and the next one is we're hard at work um, getting the next one ready in September. So thank you again. Have yourselves a wonderful day and um, I look forward to hearing from you.